Country Stage 5 from Vittoria Gasteiz to Amo Rebieta at Sharno. Uh, but the big news was in yesterday's stage on Stage 4, which was the first, supposed to be the first real GC stage, uh, where there was a massive crash in the descent of the uh, Olaeta climb down to the Unchilla climb. Uh, and I've never seen a crash take out so many GC, the, the top yeah. four GC contenders out of the top five in one race. And uh, Vingegaard, Avonapool, Roglic, Vine, Kras, Quinn all had to abandon the race. I'm not sure if there's any other abandoned, but they were the obviously the four big GC guys as well as uh, some of the four most uh, most injured. When we first, the descent was, it's quite at the start of the descent, but when the breakaway went through, we saw that uh, Bergado, who'd been in the break of four or five, had run off on this descent uh, yeah. on the exit, and I think he stayed up in the forest. Uh, it's a it's a right hand sweeping turn where it's it turns and then straightens up a bit and then turns again in on itself. Not that sharp, very high speed, uh, and then the exit. Basically, it wasn't a cliff or anything. It was a runoff into a field off camber, sloping down away from the road and uh, had a culvert in the gutter. Well, not even in the gutter. There was just a massive culvert, yeah. a concrete embankment or a concrete ditch quite in a V-shape, quite deep, uh, and also large boulders uh, scattered around the culvert or ditch or however you want to call it, as well as trees. And uh, that was the exit of the corner after the apex. And so we saw Bergado run, a, run aground there without getting off the bike. So he held it up, but probably they weren't going quite as quick in the breakaway. And then we see the helicopter shot of just bodies essentially scattered all through this uh, corner. And uh, how did you see it, Benji? There's also the, some of the Basque local riders uh, also had some, some local knowledge that we, you couldn't see about the corner. Yeah, first of all, the first reaction is fuck, fuck, fuck. It's like you see riders laying on the road and you get immediate flashbacks of moments that have happened in the past where we've literally lost riders in the sense and, and I, I don't like going through that again. And we, we have images of, like, when it comes to the images, let's get this out of the way first. I'm fine with them showing a crash once, twice, rep repetitions of crashes in, in necessary angles, stuff like that. But I don't, I don't necessarily need 17 replays of close-ups of riders barely moving on the floor. That's too much for me. And, and then the, orga, the, the broadcaster decided to, to put some, some, some action music on, on the crash replays. And I, I, didn't, I didn't think the replay and the, the whole broadcasting was handled the way it should be handled. That out of the way first. But, like, when you see Vingegaard laying there, he's barely moving. I, I'm worrying... No, I, I don't really, like, at that point, you don't care, or I don't care about, okay, is he going to the Tour de France or not? I'm thinking, can he cycle again? Because if a cyclist is not moving on the floor, or barely moving, then I'm immediately worried like that. And and Jay Vine, uh, literally the same. Remco was uh, one of the ones that was up very quickly, so I was like, okay, looks like a collarbone, should be, should be relatively fine. Cross looked pretty bad as well. Sean Quinn sat up, so I, was, I wasn't overly worried for him necessarily. Roglic started walking pretty swiftly, so it, it, it were the ones, the, the Vingegaard crash, the Vine crash, the Cross crash, those were the ones I was really worried about, and we, we had updates afterwards, we had updates from the, the injuries that the riders have sustained, Roglic no fractures, but finished, uh, did not finish the race, Jonas Vingegaard fractured collarbone, three broken ribs were the initial assessment yesterday, this morning that was added on to it a pneumothorax which i think is like when your lung kind of collapses no and no no it's a perforation no? in the lung it can lead oh. to lung collapse but no it's like a hole hole in the lung oh okay uh pulmonary contusion i think that's your lung getting a hit is my yeah your bruised, guess. Lung. bruised lung yeah adam quaven pool has a fractured collarbone and a broken scapula uh i i expected collarbone i was uh, it, it sucks that the scapula is in addition to that because that will have a longer recovery than just the collarbone. Jay Vine is probably, together with Cross, the worst off. Jay Vine with a cervical and two thoracic uh, spine vertebrae fractures. Fortunately, no neurological issues were reported yesterday. When it comes to Cross, pneumothorax again, multiple fractured ribs, two dorsal vertebrae fractures, Sean Quinn, concussion, sternum fracture. Like, sorry, but 
cycling sucks in moments like that cycling is a sport that i love watching but when that happens i don't want to watch it's as simple as that and then just to get this over with another crash happens early in today's stage Mikalanda brought away with stretcher again and you were talking about the, the the environment of the crash bilbao and i think biscara on social media noting that there's tree roots that are under asphalt in this area that makes the asphalt a bit wobbly but Okay, the organization did well at highlighting that the corner was dangerous beforehand, but in Isn't my that? head, well, one of the things is I can't imagine that there's a hundred corners like this within the exit, a concrete ditch. So I've, I, would, I would expect it to be financially possible to add padding to corners like that, no? Yeah, that's the thing, like... Uh... You, you see in the front on images when the when it first starts and uh, you see remco's head just bobble like fully pur porpoise as if he's going over cobbles and it takes him off his line and they're already too late to break so it is a dangerous section of road because when the, the riders look at it they think they can make it through at a certain speed because it also looks like a normal road surface and then bang they're, they're going over tree roots and stuff that takes them off their trajectory and it's too late to break uh, Bill Bow though, Bill Bow said maybe we do, we go too fast. Like what? And and I agree. Why is there mm -hmm. such a huge fight? Forty k's to go to the finish, on the not the biggest GC day. The the next climb is not going to be a pivotal climb. There's a valley, false slap well, valley before the next climb. It's it's um and, and the guy and the guys are four wide. Ironically, the reason for the positioning is because teams might see it as a dangerous descent and they they say let's get to the front let's make sure we are at the front and then the other team says uh, let's let's make sure we are at the front to make sure we're not behind crashes but then you get the 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 waves of speed that just go faster and faster yeah. and faster and that's one thing but we also got to think uh, got to keep in mind i saw a stat the other day that the tour of flanders this year was four kilometer per hour faster than in 2017 like there's innovation happening in this sports shit hits the fan earlier the races are faster are the safety precautions in the race handled according to the the speed changes is that well, a yeah, question we can well, look that's at what what? Has, that's what matter yeah. said he said everyone if you don't have a 56 10 56 up front 10 on the back you won't follow on the descents now like there and you you see the speed at which they hit that corner they go on 80 on a basque twisty corner so uh, I agree with what Bill Bow said, elements of it, and, mm -hmm. and other writers have echoed that. Uh, but what you alluded to, Benji, as well, these are not... Uh, there are not actually that many dangerous descents or corners in this race. Because I, you cannot barrier off every corner, every exit yeah. for 200Ks, six stages in a row. Unreasonable, unfe unfeasible. The Orglambrek crash, for example... I think it was on a random stretch of flat road. It's like a that is like a freak yeah. accident, uh, unfortunately. But here, there's there was two descents of note in this whole stage. Yeah. And then how many on how many corners on those two descents have a culvert, a, a concrete ditch on the exit, and trees, and some of those guys would have been going through those trees. Mark Soler fucking and Remco bunny hopped the culvert at like yeah. seventy. They bunny hopped it. But they would have gone through those trees thinking, ooh, this could be, this could be bad. And there's boulders there. If you slide out, hit a boulder like that. So, yeah, I, 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 I think uh, it's a very, it, like, there has to be a nuanced discussion about it in that, okay, why, why are the speeds higher? Why is there so much pressure? But also then, okay, I'm sorry, but I, I don't think every corner, and there's not so many, have so many dangerous elements that if it, and by the way, when lightning strikes twice, Benji, when the brake guy goes off the corner and then yeah. the peloton all stack up in the corner and how many times a year... Okay, there's lots of crashes. How many times a year are there this many guys this badly hurt? Then I'm sorry, it's not a normal corner or a normal exit. I fully agree, but there's also other things that come into effect in addition to that. Uh, I swear, I, I checked a replay, I think... 20, 25 times, and there was a Trek rider involved. I think it was Natnael Tesfatsion, who also abandoned before today's race, but I don't recall there being fractures involved for him. But it looked like his front uh, tire, like, 
had an issue as he had hit a wobble on the road in that same corner. So maybe there was a serious wobble, but I, I swear his tire collapsed or something uh, during that corner. But I could be wrong, but that's how I perceived uh, how I perceived that corner as well from the track rider's perspective. But then we look at all the other things when it comes to safety. We there's been numerous discussions in the last week about you, you saw that discussion about the. The kind of, it looks like a bulletproof vest, but then it like becomes an airbag when you crash. But then, I, then I'm like, okay, it's, it's a kilo of extra weight. Riders are clearly removing weight from their bike and in, in all likelihood, reducing safety by a little in doing so as well in, in the way it's being presented in cycling right now. But that's one of those things where you gotta, you gotta then think about, okay, temperature control. It's suddenly going to be fucking hot when you put that on. I uh, think is not... I'm sorry, if you hit that concrete ditch or a rock at 70 kph, that yeah. thing ain't doing shit. On all, on all the presentations of that product, right, the people fall over with it. Like, sorry, yeah. but riders aren't <laughs> standing still. They're not riding 12k an hour, they're riding 60k an hour, 70k an hour. Remco was going 78, I think, according to Strava. I think Luke yeah. uh, pulled that up today. Like, also, that, riders, that's fucking fast. Riders don't give a fuck about doing their collarbone. Like, yeah. okay, like they miss races, and but they, they literally get the surgery done. They're back on the train in 10 days, you know, win Paris Bay two months later. Like, they're not, okay, they don't want to do it. I'm not saying that they obviously don't <laughs> want to break their collarbone, but they're not kept up at night about breaking their collarbone. What they're kept up at night about is running off a descent like that, and then anything can happen much worse than a collarbone. And that did for some of these riders because, yeah, we have these provisional provisional injuries but uh, there's not been too many updates so far this afternoon and and really best wishes to all those involved yeah. uh and, and particularly Vingegaard Vine and and Steph Kras because they appear to be the most uh most badly hurt but yeah really to all of them and and I hope I hope all of them make a full and complete recovery uh and a pain free and yeah they're back on the bike or back living normally as soon as possible because it was very, very scary and almost, almost lucky. Like, like there's luck and bad luck. Like Roglic, two days in a row, crash at like 65 kilometers an hour plus. He gets straight back up. And then, you know, Vine is on the other end of the spectrum, not his fault at all. And, and, and he's much more badly injured than, than Roglic. But also it could have been worse. When I first saw the crash, I really thought yeah, this could be really bad. Like really, really bad. So, uh. Like, yeah, six one half does the other. It is horrible that the standard has become that we react to a, a medical bullet down with four fractures. Oh, it's only that. Like with Vingegaard, that was the reaction, which that's crazy that that has to be the reaction. And I fully agree. Uh, I wish everybody that crashed to full recovery, also the riders that crashed at Scheldeprijs, Gerben Thijssen broke his ankle, Findel Barra broke her ankle at Ronde, Ronde de Mouscroon, I think, last week as well. There's just so many big ass injuries at the moment then it's just very there's something that is causing more crashes and whether it's the the nervousness in the peloton the behavior in the peloton or in my opinion at least for a, a partially responsibility of a race safety still like uh thierry Gouvenu of the of the tour de france route guy what was already like oh it's um it's all because um, the riders are riding differently, stuff like that. I think he specifically said something according to the gears as well, which I, it's kind of true. But this is also the guy that uh, that defended his own his own race design, where there was a corner in the last sprint say, when he said, "Oh, corners make sprints safer." Uh, that was also bu fucking bullshit. So, like, the there has to be consistency across the board, and everybody look, needs to look into their own pockets to get the safer. Because, like. This is also, I spoke to Findel Barra yesterday about, about potential reasons for this. We went over every single one of the potential topics of like, what, what could be better in cycling? And when it comes to equipment, I'm going to get sh shit on for saying this, by the way. But this brakes break faster in rain. Fully agree, right? Yeah. It will they work? But if riders know that they can break faster... Do they not have the behavior of, I'm going to break as late as possible, trying to be the one that breaks as late as possible in doing so? Yeah, I mean, you can probably compare it. If you watch a helicopter shot of the approach to hairpins, 
and you see how riders approach hairpins now and it's like if you try to approach a hairpin like that on carbon clinches or, or carbon tubs with rim brakes back in the day with a bit of rain like you'll just go straight to a hairpin so yeah they can break later um but i, I, I don't know i also is the behavioral aspect as well like if you go compare with so many favorites here yesterday mm -hmm. and like top top guys and then you look at catalonia I swear, Catalonia, everyone on the descents, Poggy, UAE went to the front. Everyone was chilling. And I don't remember. They, listen, they're not as dangerous in Catalonia. They weren't as deep. I accept that. But I'm just, it's also a behavioral thing as well. Like, um, if there's four top GC favorites, it's also impossible for all four to be at the front. Yep. And, and that, you know, that really was a single file descent, mate. Like, Catalonia, they're just doing single file descents. So, I don't know, Benji. Um, I also maybe some DSs. There could be a risk reward analysis of like who is really losing races by by seeding a few positions yeah. on a descent. I'm not talking like really getting dropped on a descent, but just like, like who's are you losing races? Forty five, fifty k's from the finish. Is it not about yeah. that? Is it about avoiding crashes? I don't know. It's I, it's really I complicated. Agree. But in Basque Country, we have historically seen splits on the send as well that have led yeah, to true. things. But then again, maybe not on the stage that we had yesterday. So I'm not sure that argument fits on, on that one specifically. But I think it's it, it sucks very much that it happened. There's definitely things that can be better across the board. But at first, I just wanna, I want everybody to recover as fast as possible, to be honest. Yeah, and but yeah, that, that discussion could be had. I, I personally don't think there's much argument to say that the exit of that corner was acceptable because there weren't Correct. many climbs yesterday. There weren't many descents on the parkour, you know, and to have that level of dangerous furniture on the exit of a corner like that, I don't think is acceptable. I would be extremely interested in, in, in knowing how this safer organization of the UCI is set up because... I'm a very big fan of centralized data on crashes and so forth. And I feel like that should be part of an independent organization like Safer to be able to apply that across all races, the advice from that same board. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you'd think that, the, I mean, it's the UCI job and the CPA to check the course. But uh, anyway, we'll move on to today, today's stage. Uh, Benji already mentioned also that Lander crashed out. That was pre-coverage. We don't know exactly how yeah. it happened, but it was it was not just a light crash either. He was stretched away in a neck brace. Uh, so very unfortunate for him, you know, local rider. Yeah. And and a big chance to a, a minimum podium this race. So also incredibly important for the Tour de France. So hopefully Lander comes back as soon as possible. Uh, today's stage 158 Ks. Opakua was the first climb, 6.2 K, 6%, 40 Ks in. Then like some Misk Valley for about 80 Ks. I'm looking at yesterday's stage. Not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Start again. 177 Ks, finishing in Amora Bieta at Chano. Uh, they start on a plateau for 40 Ks, then a descent, then another valley around the finish line. Then they do the Urkiola climb. 5.6 Ks, 9.1%, category one climb. Quite difficult before a step descent around the finish line again. And then they go and do two laps of the Muniket Muniketa Gaina climb. Muniketa Gaina. That name, bro. That's a tough one. 3.4k, 7.3%. Uh, they do it twice. The last one is 13k from the finish. The little kicker uphill fossilite drag on a highway, uh, about 5k's from home. Leading GC before the stage uh, was Schielmoza by process of elimination, literally. Uh, Ayuso, four seconds behind him. Uh, Kevin Vokla and Shackman on 6 seconds McNulty 13 Armin L 14 Bill Bow 15 Gregoire 18 so very very tight uh, gaps even Del Toro on 32 because uh, basically I don't even know well I can't remember the time loss to be honest I, I, stopped, I don't give a fuck about GC here anymore so I <laughs> same stopped. yeah but uh, Menchie's all, I should also say for completeness Menkes, the break was allowed to ride for it yesterday. Menkes won uh, because they were already ahead uh, from that breakaway. Which was away. like nobody cared anymore who would win the stage, but that the breaker was able to ride for the stage, even though they would have been caught otherwise, was fucking stupid, in my opinion. 
yeah, a little bit strange. A little bit strange. Um, but uh, the show must go on. Uh, and yeah, we had... But today, actually, you know, I was feeling pretty down and uh, about everything, to be honest. And I was yeah. really not fussed about this race. I like to, I even watch it. And uh, today's stage was actually really good. It really was entertaining. Um, Got to say, the coverage that was, was shown and when coverage started. Was there even a break formed when coverage started, Benji? Or you were in the car? I don't I think there no was. I have no fucking clue. I think there was. I don't think there was. I think there was a, an attack from Cousin Del Toro on, on that climb that you mentioned with Hard the not one. crazy name. Uh, and that was the first move I noticed. That's right. So obviously... Yeah, teams now being super aggressive with really... There's two strong teams here now. Trek for Schelmoza and UAE with McNulty, Ayuso and Del Toro. Uh, they're the two, the two dominant teams here. And yeah, Kuz went on the Urkiola. He, I presume it was him because it is more pacing. It's just pre-coverage. Del Toro goes with him. They go over the top, get to the descent, get to the valley and realize, pull up stumps because they ain't going anywhere in a... Oh, how long is it? 30k valley. Trek chasing, one assumes... Uh, and then they get to the first rep of the, the Muna Ketigaina. Uh, look at that climb. And basically all hell breaks loose. There's a, oh no, before then, there's a, <laughs> there's a counter move. And, and multiple attacks were going in this valley uh, that had Stan Mitic, Schmidt, who's back in action. He won a stage here last year. Harrison Wood on Kofidis. Bergado, who was in the break yesterday. Tushfeld, Asperin, Ivan Kobo, Jimmy Janssens, and Jose Manuel Diaz. So... Should Trek have been so? Should Trek have invested so much to chase this Benji? I think it's fine to to invest to chase that. Your riders in the leader jersey. I don't actually know how close these riders were in GC, so that's the only reason that I'm not sure not how much close. they they should have chased. Oh, okay, well, one oh, one thirty, one thirty, but that's a big gap here. Yeah, I, I they never really got one thirty, so maybe they started facing it too hard, if that makes sense. But then again, if you if you can keep it relatively close, then maybe you can lead it, let, let it go out a little bit later. But no, nah, I, I think you can, you can let the gap go out a little bit, keep it within maybe 130, stuff like that, because you're going to get to the climbs and you're going to have attacks in your group anyway, you know? So I, I didn't think these guys were going to get the jersey that way. I think they were thinking Skelmo is a stage win, which is, you know, he, that's what they, I think they were thinking at that point. Uh, uh, but, it's fair to, to think that though, eh? Because he's got the sprint. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying he couldn't. Um, but I'm saying, spoilers, he couldn't. Well, he, he in theory he could, but then you got to think <laughs> what's going to happen. UAE is sitting in the wheels here. You're spending your domestiques. The argument is also then if you don't spend, uh, what's your man's name? Who's here? If you don't spend Bernard or Fellini or Molina here, then they yeah. ain't making it over. And Bagioli, exactly. Um, Bagioli's, yeah, he's lost. He's lost two wasp kilo. Maybe we'll see that in autumn. Um, <laughs> like it's actually incredible that Bagioli is like a non-factor in this stage. Yeah. It's actually, well, unbe actually unbelievable. But he was anyway, a solid domestique, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he came second in Lombardi by Pog yeah. in October. <laughs> it's a big group at the end. Uh, but yeah, I accept he was in a domestique role here. Um, Attacks on the climb. The breakaways brought back by attacks on the climb. Del Toro, I think, or Arietta was going. UAE were going over and over again. Maybe even Soler getting into moves. Yep. And I couldn't even see it exactly. I don't know if he even attacked on the descent. But basically, uh, Le Cerf, William Le Cerf, who, by the way, the, the fact that he didn't crash yesterday was crazy. He was like, just held it up. And he, he, I think he must be very, very good on the bike downhill uh, or handling Le Cerf. He attacks. Uh, he's joined by the remnants of the breakaway, Schmidt, Stalin, Mittet, Bergado, and as well as Arietto Betragos with him. So now we, I'm Brandon Rivera. So GC guys were getting amongst it here, Benji. And this yep. was now Trek were getting put under real pressure because UAE, were, UAE tactics were good today. Exactly. And that, that first Munich Itagaina, whatever it's called, climb, showed a real indication that UAE's attempts at rolling attacks is entire bloody stage from this point onwards because... You said it, Arieta went, Del Toro went, but also in this group, Mark Soler is present in that group. So we're seeing every single rider except McNulty and Ayuso going and rolling into attacks right here. And, and that attack keeps going for a little bit, but like you said, Little Trek is in control. And at that point, actually, Bajoli, speak of the devil, he was at the front pacing in the peloton. He caught that group with, with Soler and Lacerre. And 
The thing is, when it happens, when they get caught, tempo goes down a little bit because tracks are like, okay, we don't need to super pace anymore. Another attack falls with 30 kilometers to go. And that includes Mauro Schmidt, Stornemitut, Burgodo again. It's like when, when that group got caught, these riders attack again. And they get caught again, which then leads to other attacks. Uh, once again, Stornemitut, Kwiatkowski, Rocha, Ibon Ruiz from Ken Pharma, and Mark Donovan. And this group actually stayed the way for, I would say, a solid 5 to 10 kilometers because we were closing in towards that second ascent of the... Why am I doing this to myself? Munikata Gaina climb? And to get it over with when it comes to the breakaway, brake shatters at the foot because Rocha is trying to drop everybody. There was one rider, I think, Quiato, that was able to follow him a bit longer, but Rocha was the strongest one in the group, apparently, on that climb. And once again, Yoi showing up at the front of the peloton group here. So attacks are flowing again, but it's DSM that launches with, well, what's his name? The Narwhal is back? You're muted, my friend. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I was too excited. And Hubble's back. I haven't seen him since he dropped Van der Poel in a descent in the Giro in 22. Uh, and he, or 21. And he, he was being, well, then, and then coming from behind was Del Toro again, or Arietta. Every UAE rider, by the way, looks the same. Like, literally, they all have their hoods set up exactly <laughs> the same. They're all, like, like lanky. Um, they all have, they're all very similar, especially Arietta and Del Toro. Oh, but it was Del Toro, I think. And he has Oscar Only in the wheel. And I'm thinking, ooh, Oscar Only, winner on Willunga. And they, Oscar Only gets that group attacks. Skelmoser and Trek plays pretty well. They've got Shackman attacking as well, big attack. And basically, Gegenhart, I think, had shut it down pretty well. And Skelmoser was left isolated for the last 300, 400 meters of the climb. I actually yep. do wonder whether attack would have been the best version of defense for, for Skelmoser. Mm -hmm. Like, if you really felt good, then maybe you want to thin it out on, the, uh, on that final climb of the name which cannot be pronounced. Uh, <laughs> because in no, the don't end, warm you, your way out of this pronunciation. I'm You're not trying doing, it. I'm, I've had enough. I've had enough uh, <laughs> of it. <laughs> and yeah, he's, he stops. He gets to that group. We see Ethan H is in the group. We see Carlos Rodriguez is there. And a big group comes back. Santi pushes on the descent. Shackman completely. Shackman does what Van Aert did. In the highest Cabell stage. Yeah. Literally saying uh, it's a Bahrain rider again. Santi comes through. Shackman, one corner, overbreaks way too much. Just like freaks out. I don't think he's a terrible descender, but there's one <laughs> corner, he just overbreaks way too much. Santi gets a gap. He's on the, the moto bumper. And then Shackman chases Santi this whole descent with uh, Ayuso, Del Toro, Schelmo. Schelmo are, in fact, in his wheel. And that, that kind of helped. And that's with Van Aert, but chasing Bilbao and the highest Cabell finish. Uh, and then we get to this valley, and I'm thinking, Benji, one thing. Schelmo's is fucked. It's a highway. Yeah. It's, it's rolling fast light terrain. The group's like 45, 50 guys. UA got three or four. I was like, he is in big trouble here. Yeah, exactly, because he's isolated. And I didn't see Gagan Hard uh, at that point. So whether he was still at the back of the group or not, I didn't know. And I was thinking maybe Ineos hater Carlos Rodriguez. Carlos is here in GC, he's on 50 seconds in GC, I think. It's a shock that he's still here, because if you look at his hand, I don't think he should have started a few days ago anymore. But that being said, the fact that they're still in the group, I would have offered up Carlos Rodriguez, not his GC position, but to, to somewhat control the group to try and uh, get Hater a chance here again. Because H Hater two years ago can't be gone. Hater Romany last year can't be gone, even though it kind of feels like he is at the moment. And then the 70,000th attack of Del Toro happens. <laughs> Del Toro starts to attack, and Del Toro starts to attack again. And I feel like this man attacked 17 billion times, but it, it's really Trek. First of all, Skelmo's at the front when Del Toro does that move. Um, Skelmo's uh, kind of responds to that himself. But when he's caught, when Del Toro is caught, we see a, a perfect move by Brandon McNulty. He attacks over the top of Skelmoz, who obviously stops because he's caught Del Toro, and he doesn't instantly respond to McNulty attacking, and then he realizes I have to pace again. So then Skelmoz starts to pace behind McNulty, and then we see a man, uh, a savior for Skelmoz, show up on the right side of our screen, passing rider by rider in the peloton. Looks like he's still eating something or something. Gagan Hard, right? He was back? Yeah. Gegenhardt did an excellent job. 
uh, in this race for Skelmoza without him. I think Skelmoza looks loses time. Like really, it's un inevitable he would have lost time. Uh, and you don't you don't just easily bring back someone like Brandon McNulty uh, on your own. And so yeah, Gagan Hart hats off to him. He had a heart. Not only is he coming back from a bad crash last year, he himself had a hard crash in this very race. And he's stuck here and he's helping, you know, he's out of GC himself. And he, he helped Skelmoza to the point of exhaustion. So that was really, really cool to see. Uh, then a tunnel happens. McNulty's clear. Armirel or a decathlon had been closing him down. The tunnel finishes. A Kern Farmer rides off the front and Brandon McNulty's no longer there. So we're like, what's going on? <laughs> Still chaos, more attacks. Del Toro goes again. Carlito. Carlos Rodriguez yeah. with one hand. He'd been chatting to Hayter. You can see they've been chatting. You yeah. can go for it. Gets to the wheel of Del Toro after Del Toro attacked really hard. Hesitates maybe one second and then decides to go over the top of him. Don't know if it would have made too much of a difference. Uh, but he goes, gets a nice gap. There's a double right-hand corner. He rails. Uh, but unfortunately for him, Shackman leads it out behind uh, and catches uh, Rodriguez, who I think did a really good job. You can't blame what, what he did. I think it was the right yeah. play from Ineos too, because he ain't going to do a great lead out. And, uh, but unfortunately for him, Shackman brings him back. Gregoire comes out of the wheel of Pache, who was in front of him, and Gregoire just nailed Shackman on the line. He was very, very strong. Aula comes up the barrier, second, Shackman third, Pache fourth, Aaron Baru fifth, couldn't win a sprint against himself. Santi sixth. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Bilbao seventh. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> like Aaron Baru should have been going in the kickers in the, in the chaos at but this he's like point. Kung. He's like Stefan Kung. Kung is everybody's spacing mate. Aaron Baru is everybody's lead out. Yep. Uh, House Housen? Eighth. <laughs> Batistella, ninth. Carlos Rodriguez, tenth. Uh, Hater finishes 15th. You'd probably be disappointed with that. I would say, you know, Housen finishing eighth. You'd, you'd want to be in the top three in this sprint, I think. Uh, but he said he hasn't been training sprints. But to be honest, like the, the strange thing is like, Hey, does 10 minute wasp per kilo it must be really good. And 20 yeah. minute wasp per kilo must be really good. But uh, the, the real news is, uh, is Gregoire's first World Tour win. The 21 yeah. year old on uh, Groupama FDG. He is, yeah, one of my personal favorite riders. Uh, he'd won the GC of Quatre Jours de Dunkirk and the Tour de Limousin last year. But, you know, those Arno de Mar type races, there's a step up here, second in Four Nardesh Classic earlier in the year behind. Juan Ayuso and today wins the stage of Pays Vasco. Allons enfants de la patrie, la joie de gloire est arrivée. Allez, Roman! Allez. Vive Roman Gregoire. I, I really like Gregoire. I think he's a great writer. And, uh, Where did I deserve this? <laughs> he's ten, even in Torino, he's climbing like. Yeah, really. A TT. 21, real nice. Um, He's a very good rider. It's as yeah. simple as that. And it's good to see his first World Tour victory. I'd, I'd rate this, these kind of stage, I'd rate this on like a, a Roman D reduced sprint kind of vibe kind of stage that... It's just uh, like Schelling and uh, Schmidt winning here. Yeah, which it's still a World Tour victory. It's still a step yeah, yeah, up yeah. from the victories he's had so far. So that's the one that knocks the door down. And there's many others that will follow. And I'm curious... How good he will be in, in Ardennes, for example, in the future, where that's already going to be this year, whether he's up there with the best or where that will be next year. Don't know, but I'm very hyped to see, uh, very hyped to see him win. And I feel like I've, I've had that a few times with French riders in the last few weeks. Like La Perra's with victory, same thing. First World Tour victory, probably going to be more in the future. But also it's, it's one of those like lower World Tour level victories, but that doesn't mean other ones can't follow necessarily because he's also still relatively young. Then... Um, Ewan Kost, you had his first UCI Pro yeah. win? Yeah. So he's been knocking he, on the door, good. he's good in Provence or Bessege or whatever. So it's... Where's Volk here? So yeah, to the, the GC standings, uh, Schielmoser leads still. Shackman moves closer though with the bonies coming, four yeah. bonies. Could have been, Shackman could have been in the GC lead with about yeah. three inches off it. Uh, he's on two seconds. Ayuso is on four seconds. Volk is on six seconds. Another French rider. Uh, very highly touted. Gregoire on, uh, on eight seconds. McNulty, uh, 13 seconds. Armour 14 seconds. Bilbao, 15. Aaron Baru, 23. Jagat, 30. Del Toro, 32. I'm looking for GC relevant guys. Santi, 37. Hindley, 47. 
Soler, uh, 47. Brana Rivera, 121. That'll do. That'll do. If you're that far back, I think you're going to struggle. All right, yeah. Uh, tomorrow's stage, the classic Ibar, you know, this is the stage I was probably looking forward to most out of a, a few stages this year to see Remco, Roglic, and Jonas go against each other and against a very, very strong UA team with Vine in, in fantastic shape, but not to be. Instead, well, there was still the same stage, 138Ks, and it's 5K, 7% descent. 9Ks, 5.6%, but it's a fake news climb. There's steeper parts. 10K Valley, not that long at all before the Crabbelin, the hardest climb in the whole race. 5Ks, 9.5%, with uh, 3Ks, at about 11.5%, very, very difficult. Short Valley, Trabacua, 3.3k, 7%. Then some rolling hills uh, before the Izuir Arate climb, 4k, 9.1%, with some steeper pinches in there. Another descent in the Urca Regi climb, 5k, 4.6%, before a false flat, 10k to the finish. What do you think will happen tomorrow, Benji? I think tomorrow is when UAE wins GC. Yeah. They've got 17 billion people in the top 20. Like, they've got four riders in the top 20. Four riders within one minute on a parkour where team-based strategies really works. Like, yeah. you, you named the, the climbs, you named everything, but it's a kind of stage where you look at the early climbs, you're like, okay, we can form a breakaway with a UAE rider in there. Trek will have to find a way to control all these attacks. Maybe they'll just pace the first two climbs. Maybe we'll try and keep the gap. Uh, maybe maybe they'll just send someone in the breakaway like like Hirschi for example for UAE two years ago that kind of stuff can happen and then Krabbelin is the one the the big hitter the very hard climb where you can use that climb to bridge towards your rider in the breakaway and this time around it's also you have those climbs the last three climbs there's hard climbs in there like Izua can also be like a, a jumping point to the breakaway if you don't want to risk doing it midway the stage on Krabbelin yet but there's multiple one multiple of those like attacking point and you don't have a rati at the end of the finish anymore eh? at the end of the stage which which makes it even more satellite rider possible no yeah like they, they should just try to drop every trek domestic on the first climb it's it's harder than the climb today the, yep. the, the finishing climb so mark soler should just jump full gas on the first climb yeah and uh then it's going to be a very very hard day for schelmerzer mm -hmm. and trek um, Del Toro, 20 attacks again. Yeah, I, I think... Uh, where's only? The Coughlon should follow. They've got three riders in the top 25? Only's on four minutes. So only could win like Godou one from the break uh, against Roglic. Yeah. Decathlon, who have they got for GC? They've got Armila in there. Gold is still here. And La Pera in 26th. Gaul's still in the race. Yeah, but he's... Where is he? He's on, he's on five, 5 minutes 49, sorry, but... Yeah, but you never know why. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think Del Toro wins GC. And I'm going with only uh, from the breakaway. Okay. I think that's... Uh, I think that's very possible. I think Del Toro winning GC is very possible as well. That was actually one of the names I, I would have taken myself, but I'm going to go with... Um... I love your Del Toro pick. Why did you do that? I'm not okay with that. I think he's uh, stronger than Ayuso. I'm going to go with Ayuso just because of the fact that you stole my Del Toro pick before you realized I wanted it. But <laughs> that being this said... Is, well, this is a real big opportunity yeah. and test for the two French guys, French young guys we just mentioned. Gregoire Vaucalin, a French rider, has never won a World Tour race in GC since the yeah, since it was since it was called World Tour. I don't see winning for them, to be honest. On if they were going to win one tomorrow, with no Vingegaard, no Roglic, no Pogacar, no Evenepoel, with Schelmos leading GC, I don't. Yeah, I also but... don't think they. I also don't think they will do it. But it's a huge opportunity. And I really think I would I would love to see it. So, but even podiuming would be fantastic for those riders yeah, in this. Yeah, that'd race. be huge. How do you think Shaq Shaqman looks come all the way back? He looks all the way back, but those grounds tomorrow are a different story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This whole five stages, this whole five stages doesn't really matter because yeah. tomorrow is so different and so like, hard. I mean, maybe Pale Bill Bow and Santi are actually the best climbers in this race. 
is on it a year eight? 13th might still move up into top five. Yeah. Like, and with the technical descents as well, like, so many, literally, I think possible to win GC is at least five riders. Yeah, yeah. Maybe more. I think possible to win GC is, is a long list. So it's uh, unfortunately at the same time as Paris Bay Femme, according to Luke finishing. So that's a bit of a shame because, like, yeah. uh, Catalonia and Herrn Wevelhem, they stagger it. The Monjuic Barcelona stage. That's a bit of a shame, but uh, we'll cover both in the recap pod tomorrow. And we'll try to watch both. Try to watch. <laughs> try to watch both. Uh, Mate, try to watch. Both. I'm gonna be so fucked because I'm riding the Paris Bay challenge tomorrow morning. Really? Yeah, the 70k version. So the last eight sectors, but it's like nine sectors because the eighth one is for some reason two sectors in one. So that's gonna uh, be fun. Is there any other news? Uh, other news was a leak, that, or not a leak, a report from Daniel Benson that uh, he says Classics Revelation Lawrence Pithy will join Bora Hansker in 2025. Um, which I guess if that's true, goes to show the, yeah, they're a serious player in the market, like Little Trek. It's no longer just the Visma, the UAE, the Ineos of old. Little Trek and Bora, I would say, are in the market, making moves of, the, of equivalence or maybe even bigger. So, But also, they don't have a. A yeah, real classic have... team at the moment. They're like, no. Mayus can do, can do Abelham Kuhn kind of vibes, but he ain't winning Ronde van Vlaanderen or top 10 in that race. So um, I, I see that they have the need for that as well in their roster. And with Paulette going, with Sagan going a few years ago, they now have to fill that spot. I think Piffy's a good rider for that. I am a bit worried though, because outside of Sagan, I don't vividly remember, and maybe Holler one time, or was that on Bahrain that Holler was good? Like, most Classics riders on this team don't actually show up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they did it with Sagan, but that was when Pachi Villa was there. I don't know. Um, I'd have to look through it. I'd have to look through it. Uh, they've been good in the Ardennes. They're yep. a pretty good Ardennes team. But uh, yeah, the Cobble Classics, not maybe their forte. Uh, but Pithy certainly, like, 21, he's been unbelievable in the, uh, in the spring. So... He was probably the probably the the biggest classics prospect out of contract. Uh, hmm. Probably, but it's also like we have seen his limits. So now I'm wondering how can they evolve past that because his limits were in the likes of Kurne, in the likes of Kent Wevelgem, That once it got towards the the last twenty five, last fifteen percent of the race. Of the, of the hill zone, he he cracked while the other favorites didn't. So a bit of percentage extra, he can definitely he can definitely get over that. But those two races are not the same as as RVV necessarily. But I do recall him being relatively okay in RVV. No, wasn't he in a group at some point? Uh... Or a different one of the other classics? But there was one classic outside of the sprint once, outside of Kurnikent. That I did see him where I would have thought he might have dropped already. I don't remember where. I'm just looking to see to test your theory about Bora. But yeah, they haven't top ten Flanders in. I'm still clicking. <laughs> Since Sagan won, no. Since Sagan came sixth in 2018. Oh, okay. So yeah, Pithy is is that guy. Well, I, I think Pithy can top ten Tour of Flanders in the future. That's not exactly a hot take. Um, he'd be hoping for better than that. Uh, yeah, I think so. But yeah, that's, I think uh, trying to win Kent Wevelgem, trying to win Kuhner, those kind of things is definitely possible. Um, and how much he can gain in an RVT style race, I don't actually know. He he is pretty tall, no, he's a meter eighty five, but he's not the. Not that he's big. a skinny one eighty five rider, no. Yeah, he's not that big. Um, He's not like eighty. He's not like Florian Vermeer or anything like that. Okay. Um, he's like Van der Poel. Yeah, but yeah. Weird yeah. comparison, but I think you know what better. I mean. What better? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I like Lawrence. <laughs> oh. um, he's not like Macho. Come on. Mm. Too much of a favor to like this take year. Take it. Take it or leave it. <laughs> what? Spinning on the fence thing is a bit strange, no? 
Uh, anyway. Well, it's like, you gotta be careful. If you don't clap and cheer every time he rides past, you be careful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's enough from, from us. You'll see you with the Paravay fam recap tomorrow, as well as uh, Basque Country, one of the best stages of the year. Normally, chaos will ensue, I think, with UAE attacking. So, hope you enjoyed the pod, and we'll see you with the recaps then. Ciao.